The PSP is an incredible handheld, and honestly, one of my all-time favorites. It was the first portable to truly bring the home console experience into the palm of your hands. With absolutely beautiful graphics and full cinematic cutscenes thanks to its unique gaming format, the UMD. So in today's video, I'm going to give the console the star treatment and install some pretty cool mods into this gorgeous Glacier White PSP and see if we can make it the ultimate version of itself. So stay tuned and let's get started. How's it going? My name is Tito and welcome to another episode of Retro Renew. Today I'll be installing some pretty cool mods into the PSP in an attempt to make the ultimate version of one. The PSP in question is a 1000 model, as this is really the only one that has mods made for it, I'm guessing because all the newer models address some of the shortcomings of the original. Now in comparison to the newer models, the 1000 has arguably the worst screen of the bunch. It exhibited quite a bit of ghosting, but at the time, it really didn't matter because there was nothing else out there like it, and quite frankly, it looked amazing, and still does. But in an age with incredibly fast refresh rates and high resolution displays, we've sort of become spoiled and older devices like the PSP 1000 could use an upgrade. So I'll be installing an aftermarket IPS screen that I picked up from Retro Game Repair Shop. I actually made a video a few years ago covering a similar IPS screen mod, but that one required an adapter ribbon cable, and this one doesn't. I'm hoping that we get the same good results as the previous one, so be sure to stay tuned and find out. And the other mod I'll be installing is a very interesting looking internal HDMI video out mod. This allows you to hook the PSP to your TV and play your games on the big screen. It hooks up through this HDMI mini port where the IR receiver used to be and basically mirrors the PSP screen. It's definitely cool in theory, but let's see how it performs in practice. Together with these two mods, let's see if this is indeed the ultimate PSP. All right, so in this video, I'm gonna go over all the parts that came with the kits I'll be using. And then I'll show you how to install them into the PSP. I'll go over all their features, review the pros and cons, and of course provide you with my overall thoughts. So starting off with the IPS kit, we have the LCD panel itself, which has the same exact footprint and dimensions as the original screen, and more importantly, has a ribbon cable that is nearly identical to the original as well. This should make the installation easier and is an improvement over previous kits that required the use of an adapter ribbon cable. And the only other item included with the kit is this foam gasket to help keep dust from getting underneath the PSP screen lens. Now, moving our attention over to the HDMI kit, the first item we have is the main driver board, which intercepts the video coming out from the PSP and converts it to a 720p HDMI video signal. It then outputs that video through this HDMI mini port at the top of the PCB. And here, also connected to the main driver board, is a touch sensor, which is used to cycle through the different video output modes. The next item in this kit is the ribbon cable that connects the driver board to the LCD connector on the PSP and has this connector here to pass the video signal through to the LCD screen. Now, don't worry, this will all become very clear on how everything is working during the installation segment of the video. And the last things we have are a few strands of wires to make connections for audio and a HDMI mini adapter so we can actually connect this to a TV. Now, the last thing I got here is a micro SD card to memory stick adapter so we can actually load games. You'll need to pick one of these up because the HDMI mod removes the UMD drive, meaning you won't be able to play physical copies of PSP games, and instead we'll have to load them off of a micro SD card. All right, so that's everything that comes with both of these kits. But before I show you how to install them, let me tell you about the sponsor of today's video, iFixit. If you've been watching my channel over the years, you've probably noticed that I use the same screwdriver set pretty much ever since I started the channel. This is the ProTech Toolkit, one of the many iFixit products that I use all the time. iFixit has an array of tools available that make my life easier when repairing and modding consoles. And in addition to their amazing tools, they also have replacement parts, as well as detailed disassembly and repair guides for an array of electronic devices and video game consoles, like the Nintendo Switch and the Steam Deck. 
And for a limited time, you can save $10 on any purchase of $50 or more using the code MACHOFIX. But you have to act fast because this is limited to the first 100 customers only and is valid from April 19th and ends on April 21st at 11.59 p.m. in each of the store's respective time zones. So for all your electronic repairing needs, definitely check out iFixit using the link in the description below. And again, a huge thank you to iFixit for sponsoring this video. Anyway, now let's go ahead and start modding this PSP. Okay, to get started, we need to first pretty much tear down the entire PSP. Now, one of the things that's absolutely critical for this is organization. And I say that because the PSP has quite an assortment of different screws of varying sizes. And remembering where they go when reassembling is critical, otherwise you could damage the shell or console. Now to help with this, I recommend getting a magnetic board like this one here from iFixit. I've been using these long before they sponsored the channel, and it's an invaluable tool to help keeping all your screws secured and organized with the magnetic backing and dry erase surface. Anyway, it's just a great tool and I highly recommend it. But anyway, let's get back to the disassembly. Now, these here are the retaining screws for the UMD door. Be sure to remove them first before attempting to remove the door. Once they're out, you should be able to pry the door off using a spudger. Now, we can go ahead and begin to remove the UMD drive. With the console flipped back over, unfasten the screws securing the midframe so we can remove that also. Next up, we need to remove the motherboard. Now to take the motherboard out, carefully fish it out from underneath the Wi-Fi antenna cable. It's a bit fiddly, but it should come out pretty easily. Now before we start getting into installing the HDMI mod, we need to remove this other small mid-frame piece. And once it's out, you'll need to refasten the two screws we just removed that were securing that mid-frame. Now we actually won't be reusing this, so you can just set it aside and store it somewhere safe. So with the PSP pretty much fully disassembled, here you can see my magnetic iFixit board and how I'm able to organize all my screws. I definitely can't recommend this tool enough as it's proved invaluable whenever I disassemble consoles. If you're interested in checking it out, I'll leave a link to it down below. Okay, so now we need to go ahead and trim this plastic piece here. My preferred way of doing this is to score the plastic using a sharp blade like a craft knife. And then with a set of needle nose pliers, I carefully fatigue the plastic off by bending it back and forth along the score until it eventually breaks off. And as you can see, this usually results in a nice clean break. Next, we need to trim the small plastic fins here on the other side of the UMD drive opening. Flush cutters work really well for this.
and if you do have some rough edges, you can use a file to smooth it out. Next, we need to remove the IR receiver. The way that I did this was by applying some solder and attempting to lift it off as shown. Another way to do this would be to use hot air. Once it's removed, go ahead and cover the pads with some Kapton tape. Next, in order for the kit to be able to pull the audio from the PSP, we'll need to solder three wires to three small ceramic capacitors. This is a pretty delicate job, so definitely take your time. Here you can see where I soldered the wires to. Red is for the right audio channel, white is for the left, and black is ground. I actually resoldered the white wire so that instead of it being oriented downward as shown, it goes upward. This will help to get it out of the way of the mid-frame once we reinstall it later on. Now we can start to reassemble the PSP. Just do everything in reverse order. Here you can see where I routed the wires into the UMD drive compartment. I removed the IR receiver window, which actually would have been a lot easier if I did it earlier before installing the motherboard. So definitely be sure to do that. Now, before we proceed with reassembly, in order to install the new IPS screen, we need to bridge two pads near the LCD connector. There are actually four revisions of the PSP motherboard, so refer to the photos that High Speed I Do has provided, which indicate the pads that need to be bridged for each specific revision. I'll have a link to them down below in the video description. Bridging these pads allow the screen to display a properly positioned image, so it is absolutely necessary to do. And here's the bridged pads for my particular PSP revision. Now one thing to note is that you won't need to refasten the screws that went here. Next, we need to drop in the HDMI driver board, which is a bit of a tight squeeze. Just make sure the HDMI mini port is aligned with the IR receiver opening. Then secure it with three of the UMD drive screws. Next, we need to go ahead and solder in our audio wires. This is why I used different colors. I know that red is for the right channel, black is for common, and white is for the left audio channel. Had they all been the same color, it would have been pretty difficult to differentiate them. Next, I'll be installing the touch sensor. I find that it's actually easier to remove it completely, stick it to the location that you want, and then resolder it back to the board. Next, we'll install the HDMI ribbon cable. and then we'll install the LCD ribbon cable to this pass-through connector on the HDMI ribbon cable. I recommend folding the LCD ribbon cable like this before laying the panel down. Now, in order to install the foam gasket, only peel the release paper for the outer section. The inner piece is essentially a guide that helps to install the gasket to the metal frame. Now, 
Once the gasket is installed, continue buttoning up the console. And there you have it, the IPS LCD and HDMI kit fully installed into this PSP. So with both of these mods installed, have we made the ultimate PSP? I have to say that while not the most challenging mods I've ever done, it was by no means trivial. But is the juice worth the squeeze? Well, both the IPS screen and HDMI mod are great, but I think each offers a different value proposition given the difficulty of the respective mods and the overall enhancement that they provide in the end. So with that, let's take a look at all the new features that these two mods bring to the table. Let's start with the IPS screen mod. This one is from a guy named High Speed I Do. It's largely the same as the one I reviewed a couple years ago in terms of quality of the image and brightness, but I feel it's an improvement over the previous one with its new ribbon cable that's pretty much identical to the original Sony screen and doesn't require an adapter ribbon like the older IPS screen mod did. Comparing it with the older IPS kit, it does appear to have the same level of brightness, however, the colors did not seem to be as saturated. I mean, it's honestly pretty difficult to tell the difference even in person, unless you're looking at it side by side, and I'm not really sure if the camera's going to be able to pick up the subtle differences as well. And if you compare it to an original Sony screen, you can certainly tell that there's a difference. The brown background is a good example of this, as the original looks very much to be brown, while the new IPS kit has an ever so slightly different hue. In everyday use, this isn't a huge problem, but for the PSP purists out there, this could be an issue. However, other than that, it's in general an upgrade in my opinion, especially when you consider its improved brightness and reduced ghosting. Just like the previous IPS kit, this one has reduced ghosting when compared to the original console, which to me is pretty huge. Okay, so that's the IPS screen mod. Overall, it's a brighter panel and has reduced ghosting. To me, this is a fantastic upgrade and definitely worth considering if you have a damaged screen with dead pixels, which was pretty common on 1000 models, or you're trying to alleviate the ghosting effect. But that's enough about the IPS kit. Now let's move our attention to the HDMI mod. To use it is very easy. Simply connect it to your HDTV using the supplied HDMI mini adapter, and then you should get video and sound right on your TV. In terms of video output, there are three scaling modes to select from that you can cycle through by holding the touch sensor for a few seconds. It's not exactly clear how the image is being scaled in each of these modes, but the first one is windowed, so I can only assume that this one is integer scaled, but don't hold me to that. By again holding the touch sensor, we can go into the next video output mode, which is just a bit larger and fills the screen just a bit more. And the last mode stretches the image to fit the entire screen. Honestly, of the three different modes, this is probably the one I'll be using most. Now, other than that, there really isn't any other customization that you can do, so it is pretty limited in terms of features. But overall, it does appear to be of decent quality, although the image will look far more pixelated since the image is being stretched over a much larger area, and you're no longer looking at a small, pixel-dense PSP screen. So when it comes to features, that's about it. But now, let's go over the pros and cons. Starting with the pros, let's first talk about the IPS screen. I think it looks fantastic, and it's as close to a drop-in kit as we've seen so far, primarily because it doesn't require an adapter ribbon cable anymore. Overall, the image quality and improved ghosting are welcome enhancements over the original screen. Now taking a look at the HDMI kit, I would say that in the grand scheme of things, this isn't too difficult of a kit to install as far as HDMI kits are concerned. For example, a lot of home console HDMI kits require extensive soldering, while this one primarily utilizes the LCD connector and has a few wires that need to be soldered for audio. Additionally, the biggest pro in my opinion is the fact that we can now play PSP titles on the big screen. The PSP is honestly well suited as a home console, as many of its titles have a caliber similar to that of its bigger brother of the time, the PlayStation 2. Overall, I think these are both great kits, although I do have some reservations, so let's get into the cons. When it comes to the IPS screen, it's a bit of a bummer that it isn't a simple drop-in unit requiring just a bit of soldering. 
Now it's my understanding that you can actually use some conductive paint to bridge the pads instead of soldering, which may make the install a bit easier. However, it's my hope that a future iteration of this kit negates the need for bridging pads at all. So while the soldering that this kit requires is a bit inconvenient, I definitely do think it is outweighed by the quality of the screen itself. Now, when it comes to the HDMI kit, there are certainly a few issues that I'd like to see addressed. First, let's talk about the audio. I think it's strange that when plugged into the TV, you have audio coming out of both the TV and the PSP speakers. From what I can tell, you are unable to turn off the PSP audio while connected to the TV without turning the TV audio off also. If you turn the volume down on the PSP, the volume also goes down on the TV. It's really quite distracting to have audio coming out of both the TV and PSP at the same time. And another con is input latency. It's small, but if you look for it, you can certainly notice it. If you need as little lag as possible, for example, when playing fighting games or games that require quick reaction inputs, then this may not be the kit for you. However, if you play slower paced games, then it's certainly serviceable and you should be okay. Something else that I'm not a huge fan of is the removal of the UMD drive. I personally would like to have the ability to play my physical library of games, but I totally understand that this is necessary due to the limited space within the console. In order to install a mod like this, you need to make room and removing the UMD drive was the logical choice due to how easy it is to install custom firmware onto the console to load your games. So while this is a con in my opinion, it does appear to be unavoidable. So yes, this does mean that you need to install custom firmware onto your console in order to play games. If you're interested in learning how to do that, I strongly suggest checking out Blaine Locklear's tutorial video, which goes over step-by-step -step how to install custom firmware onto the PSP and load games onto the console. Anyway, probably my biggest gripe with this kit is the fact that you are tethered to the TV and need to use the PSP as a controller. I feel that if you're going to be making an HDMI mod like this one, having a way to use an external controller, preferably wireless, is almost a must-have feature. Being tethered physically to the TV via the HDMI cable is definitely not an ideal scenario, and somehow integrating wireless controller support would make this a far more practical and enjoyable experience. So really, at the end of the day, is this something that I would recommend? Well, if this was for me, I can't say that this is something that I would personally do to my PSP. I think there are certainly a few areas that need to be improved upon, but if you are dead set on getting decent quality digital video out of the PSP and onto your TV or capture device, then this is certainly a decent option to consider. But the question remains, is this the ultimate PSP? Well, I don't think it's there quite yet, but it's a good start. I really hope to see more mods come out for the PSP. Mods as basic as good quality battery and shell replacements would be fantastic, but also other more unique mods like a good quality HDMI video out mod with integrated wireless controller support. Or heck, even a dedicated consoleizer kit would be awesome. So we're not there quite yet, but I am confident we'll see improvements in the future, and I'm really looking forward to it. Well folks, there you have it. Two mods for the PSP. One great, and one that shows potential. While I don't think we have an ultimate PSP just yet, I do believe we are getting closer. Now, if you enjoyed this video, I really think you'll like this one here. So check it out. And as always, thank you all so much for tuning in today, and I'll catch you again next time.